All right, so first off, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I am among you, but not of you. I am not an astronomer. I am not an astrophysicist. I know nothing about lasers. I, you know, I know Paul. I know Avi. I know Jill. Um, so you know, why am I here? Well, it's going to get even stranger about why I'm here when I start talking about what I'm going to talk about. So hopefully this thing will get us to the next slide. So everybody knows that paper. Um, you know, it uh, kicked off the SETI program. It was a way of finding a channel. It did the physics to find a channel at 10 gigahertz that you could use to do interstellar communications. And you know, it's a great paper. I didn't read it at the time. I was two years old. Uh, but I read it later, um, and uh, it's a great paper. And, you know, I, I'm a science fiction fan. I, I love all of that stuff. But again, I'm not an astronomer. I never thought much about SETI. I never thought other than, you know, in the science fiction-y sort of way. Well, I got sucked sideways, uh, backwards into a problem um, in communication theory. I won't tell you how I got sucked backward into this problem in communication theory, but it resulted in this paper. And this paper, we came to the conclusion, I uh, suckered a, uh, one of uh, Bob Wilson's uh, protégés, Greg Wright, he is an astronomer, uh, into this, and we calculated the energy that it would take to communicate a given payload of bits. Okay, so this is the fundamental thing. I've got B bits, and I want to deliver it either using radiation, or I want to deliver it in some other way, and in our particular way is writing it down and, as Jill said, throwing a rock. So. Uh, this caused a little bit of a stir um, <laughs> and uh, got a lot of coverage um, in the media and everything else, and it did wonders for my expert witnessing career. I've been asked now three times on the stand. I do patent litigation sometimes. Dr. Rose, do you talk to aliens? Um, and, you know, I, and basically I just say, you know, just point to the nature paper and shut up. Uh, <laughs> so what's this session again? <laughs> this session is on optical SETI and basically using radiation. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of, that, that's me right now, um, fish out of water. But, so I, I feel compelled now to tell you why uh, the paper caused a little bit of a stir, because it upended some of the things that we thought we knew. Now, some of the things this even communication theorists we thought we knew was that, you know, you fill a truck with tapes. Paul Barron, who, one of the fathers of the internet, he used to literally do this, pack a uh, plane full of tapes, send it across the world, and it's a very high bit rate channel. Uh, it has some latency, right? It takes a little while, but it's a high bitrate channel. And you know, you kind of knew that. That's in the communication theory zeitgeist. Uh, there's a paper that came out after our paper came out, and this is really kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how many people, is there anybody here from South Africa? Because I have never been to South Africa. Apparently that is a big frightening snail from South Africa there. And uh, those are two DVDs, and if you, you know, lure it across the stage with lettuce, uh, that's faster than ADSL, okay? Um, <laughs> and, it, and yeah, I mean, it's true, but uh, you know, that's, that's what I love about that improbable research journal. But the thing is, all of that's cute, but then the training takes over. Is there a fundamental question here? And I think there is a fundamental question here. Uh, there's information delivery, and there's a cost associated with that, and it's either via photons or, in our case, via writing it down and tossing it. So now let's actually do the comparison. And we can quantify things pretty tightly. Information is bits, and that can be quantified very nicely, very tightly. And uh, cost is energy. And you know, as physicists and uh, engineers, we deal with, that's our lingua franca, energy, energy, energy. OK, so here's the basic setup. What you got is, and I'll use this one, because the red, I, can, I can't see. Um, here, you radiate something and you receive it. So there's an aperture at one end that you use to um, collimate the radiation. There's an ear at the other end, bigger ears, more radiation picked up. This, the, this I always laugh at. Uh, you write your message down, you put it, and you, right? And away it goes to the uh, destination. And now we actually have to make sure that we're comparing apples and oranges. There's some inviolable uh, time, meaning you can't go faster than light. But the basic problem is we're going to radiate, 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 and then at some deadline t, uh, t, the rock will arrive and the message will be finished. So we're comparing apples to apples in terms of the, uh, the, the efficiencies. All right. So 
I got to define two new units. One of my, well, this one is my absolute favorite, the mass information density. So and maybe none of you are communication theorists, but nobody had ever heard of something called bits per kilogram. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's what that is. And I spent six months trying to, uh, uh, my training is such that I try to rederive from first principles, what is the most ma information you can pack into some mass? Found out that Bekenstein had done it and Hawking had done it, and it was black holes, useless, you know, and very antisocial. So didn't think about that. Uh, there's this other cool thing, and this is kind of standard, right? Um, this is the transport latency. So um, you'll see it uh, appearing throughout delta. So if delta is one, you're traveling at light speed. If delta is larger than one, you're not at 10 to the ninth delta, you're kind of walking, right? So those are two new units that'll appear. And I'm gonna go pretty quickly through, you know, this stuff. We can, you know, we got nine minutes and 20 seconds. All right, so bottom line, here's your payload. That's the mass of your payload, so that's the information density, that's the number of bits you're trying to send, and the cool thing is that you can prove, and you guys already know this because you deal, uh, some of you actually deal with propulsion, uh, that the minimum energy that you need to use is the average velocity, um, and the, um, that's the average velocity and the kinetic energy. So that's all that's happening there. Um, there we do the aperture thing which you all know about, and drum roll please, this is where my particular thing comes in, and if you ever talk to information theorists, you know, all hail Shannon. Um, there's an expression that you use, but I haven't seen posted up here. There's a capacity expression, and this is kind of important. This is inviolable. So this is the amount of reliable information you can get between one place and another given an energy budget, and the energy budget is hidden in there. Not gonna go into the details. Um, so you can form this ratio the amount of energy it takes to radiate and the amount of energy it takes to write for this number of bits that you're gonna send. So, oh my God, that's the most complicated equation that I've seen since I got here off the plane. I, I'm not expecting, we're not gonna derive this. I just wanna, make, just wanna show you that it kind of obeys what you'd expect it to obey. So I'm kind of over here, uh, this delta, if you are more leisurely, that's gonna favor matter, right? Because lower uh, kinetic energy. Uh, if you can pack things more densely, that's going to favor matter, right? Because you can send more information per unit mass. If you're farther away, that's going to favor matter because the radiation, no matter what you do, del dot D equals zero, you know, can't get around that. Radiation is going to diverge. However, if you got big ears and a big mouth, that favors uh, radiation, okay? So that's a fundamental uh, result. All right, so building on that, um, here's some cool sort of stuff. So I, did, you know, I tried to do the black hole thing, tried to basically be Bekenstein and start hawking all at once, didn't work, and um, ended up doing some empirical stuff. I'll call your attention to these two. Uh, this is something we can actually do. We can construct things, take xenon atoms, put them on nickel, okay? Maybe costly, but you know, we can do it. Uh, RNA is one of the things that kind of freaked me out when I actually, you know, looked at the molecular uh, business. It's very, very dense. You can pack a lot of information into RNA. So, you know, this is what we're going to do, and now we're going to make a comparison. And there's a whole bunch of comparisons we can make. That figure we're going to come back to uh, if there are questions, but I just wanted to show you that it was there and uh, look at it, and now it's gone. All right. <laughs> so now what we're going to do is we're going to compare. We got an Arecibo dish here, say, and an Arecibo dish 10,000 light years away, and we're gonna to try to communicate between the two. And we you know, calculate the energy, and then we compare the amount of energy it would take to, using this you know, basic kinetic energy, to send those same number of bits. So you know, there's some parameters there that are worth looking at, right? Arecibo, Arecibo, um, we're using that thing that we constructed, not RNA. We're going at uh, speed of light over three, we're assuming things are chilled down at both these, at the receiver, you know, standard sort of stuff. So what's the relative ratio? Um, that's the relative ratio. It's like detonating a 24 mil, uh, megaton blast to taking a sack of sugar and putting it onto a shelf. Those are not the actual energies. It's a relative sort of thing. Uh, the factor is 10 to the 15th. When you see 10 to the 15th in anything that you do, you kind of got to step back and say, what's going on here? You can't ignore those sorts of factors. All right, so you know, you're looking at that and you're saying, oh, come on, you know, you, you, you're talking about radiating things omnidirectionally, maybe you can focus it. Maybe. Well, no, we were very careful about that. We were talking about point-to-point -point communication. 
certain aperture size, how well we could get the information there. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other things you could worry about, but I'm gonna worry about broadcast, and I'm gonna go, because that's the one that's most obvious, because if I have an omnidirectional source, that would seem to beat matter, because to communicate with you guys, I'm just yapping my mouth off here. What, I, what I'd have to do with matter is I have to write each one of you a letter, right? So that seems kind of sucky. All right, well, let's keep on, let's do this. Let's assume ever-growing spherical galaxies of the same density as the Milky Way, okay? Spherical galaxies, not flat, nice big spheres. Makes, uh, consider a spherical chicken for you physicists out there. And um, so here's a 10,000 uh, light year radius galaxy, and what you see is that you got about that many stars, but the uh, benefit to, rate, to writing is a lot larger. Let's, uh, you know, get bigger. Now we got a million light year radius galaxy, and I think that's about the upper size. Um, you know, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's about the upper size of what's observed out there. Um, still, matter wins out. Uh, let's just cut to the chase, right? 10 to the 10th, that's about the size of the visible universe. Matter still beats it, so again, we have, a vis we, have a <laughs> we have a galaxy that's the size of the visible universe with the same stellar density as the Milky Way in this model, right? And matter still beats uh, uh, radiation by a lot. And you know, there are other things, shielding, things that you might have to do, but again, you can't ignore these things. So that's the response that I hope to elicit uh, <laughs> here. Um, and that made me start thinking, I, again, I got sucked sideways into this. I don't, I didn't want to think about SETI. I mean, Jill's thinking about SETI, and that's, you know, that's great. And I can talk to Jill, and she can tell me. Um, and Avi, too. But, uh, you know, the question is, why communicate at all? And I think that was alluded to by one of the speakers. You know, I'm not a big fan of communication in the sense that, you know, hello! <laughs> you know, and oh, the dinosaurs came and went. Um, <laughs> So, I, you know, that doesn't, so sociability, I mean, that's something that you could imagine, and, you know, I'm just gonna quickly go through this, so, you know, you put something that somebody can find, and, you know, you tell them you can join the party. Um, all of that's alien psychology, um, 101. This one, the, you know, bring technology, don't eat us, that's Stephen Hawking. Um, and the other thing is, and this is where I come in, there's a universal truth, and it's agnostic. We live on a fragile, in a fragile place. So, you know, there's all sorts of ways we could screw it up or have it screwed up for us. And, well, I had, sorry, I had to put that up there. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, so I'm gonna go with survival. So now you gotta ask some questions. You know, those who, serve, those who write survive, those who don't, let's say game over, right? So that tells, suggests to me that if life is persistent, intelligent life is persistent, those that send stuff out persist, those might not. Now, that's a loose sort of argument. You know, we have an N, N, N equal one sitting here, but that's a basic, you know, biological argument. So what I've come to the conclusion of, or at least the leaning towards, that any sort of information transfer is gonna be biological or something like biological. And yes, I, I'm not gonna say the word, you know, if you type the word that you know that I wanna say into a computer, you'll come up with like some lunatic fringe stuff, but that's where, uh, that's where I come down on all of this. And you know, there's all sorts of ways that we could talk about delivering it. How to detect now, looking at the other end, you know, if everybody else is doing this stuff, you know, we do the Fermi problem again, where is it? So there's, detection is kind of interesting. You know, how do you tell whether something's an incursion or evolution? Uh, if you talk to, so I was sitting in um, uh, Paul Horowitz's office and we called Gerald Joyce, and Gerald Joyce, a killjoy biologist, uh, <laughs> said, it's all one show, there ain't nothing here, you know, nothing's ever come, and that's what it, what it is. And, you know, Gerald may be right, uh, but for a communication theorist, I kind of want to know. So, there's a bunch of fundamental questions, and these aren't, these, this is not even worth really thinking about, other than how many packages, and, you know, I don't know the answer to the first two questions, but we can kind of take a guess at the number of packages, and I come up with that figure, 10 to the 8th. Maybe it's 10 to the 4th, maybe it's 10 to the 12th, don't know. But here's what it hits for me. Um, when the paper came out in Nature, the editors, first they chose the title. My title was Write or Radiate. Their title had something to do with ET. Um, but they also, in the blurb, put this thing in there. And it kind of hit me kind of hard. It's like, wow, I guess that's what this paper is saying. But after I thought about it a little bit, I really think what the paper is saying 
and may actually be appropriate for this particular conference, because we're talking about sending solar sails all over the place, maybe we should be uh, seeding as opposed to just trying to communicate. And I know that's sacrilege, uh, but such is life. Thank you very much. Good, Phil, you're up. Hello. Okay. Um, great talk. I, I, I love the variety of thought here. You clearly are thinking outside the, the sphere, which is terrific. Uh, so one uh, critical question I have is that if we send data in a physical package, the size of the physical package that we send it in is critical to understand in terms of detectability. Because when we transmit radiation over a, a solid angle, we have the possibility of anyone within that solid angle or anything mm -hmm. detecting the signal. But when we send a, a DVD out to a planet, we basically have the ratio of the cross sections of the two things, which is an enormous factor. And I, I don't know that you've included that in this uh, detectability discussion. And also the difference between Arecibo and an optical system is profound. The gain of Arecibo is, is quite low compared to even a very modest um, optical telescope. And again, I don't know if you've considered that. Oh, stop, stop, stop. Okay, so what this figure shows is, yes, uh, the issue that's being, uh, everybody's an astronomer here. Everybody knows about uh, big mouth collimation. Well, big mouth collimation. You can focus, at, no, focus, wrong word. You can collimate your energy. So what this figure shows is different sorts of things. So let's look at this one. Let's say I had an X-ray laser with a meter-wide aperture, which is freaking huge, right? Okay. That'd be great. So this is the line where, on this side, uh, matter wins. On this side, radiation wins. So if I had an X-ray laser with a one-meter aperture, that's what I should be doing. Okay? Over here, it's much more efficient. Now, let's say I had an Arecibo te uh, 10 gigahertz telescope, but the aperture was the size of the Earth. Okay? That's, uh, if I can find it, where's the little triangly one? Uh, little squares, I'm losing it. I think it's this no, one. It's Arecibo, one Earth, uh, gigahertz, square. And I think it's just wrong. It's just, where is it? Darn it. It's on the left. Oh, there. Okay, I'm sorry. So I'm sorry. I, I had it wrong. There's the X-ray, right? And there's Arecibo, size of the Earth. So these are certainly th certainly issues that you got to worry about. The other thing about advertisement, well, one of the things is that, as everybody here knows, once you get out into space, it's just ugly. I mean, there's high energy particles flapping all around. So we even considered putting, uh, you know, our little payload, a, ki a kilogram payload, in a you know 18 meter rock. All right. Once you do that, you know, maybe there are things you can put retroreflectors and whatever else on it. The point is that you have so much gain using matter that you can afford to throw extra stuff on it. Now, technology about getting an 18-meter rock from here to wherever, you know, I'm, I'll be agnostic on that. What I'm comparing, though, is strictly energy um, and delivery. So I think I answered one of your questions there. The other one I waved my hands on. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe we could talk about it after. So just not, yes, not save it for the panel. Jim, did you have a question? And you have a question, too. Yes, if, if something were to be said, the if there's something a, a, here around us, in, in this, around our star, the obvious place to place at least some of them would be in the Lagrange points around the planets, and radar surveys of the nearby Lagrange points have seen nothing. So they're either very small or they aren't there. So what, how, that seems to indicate the number is not 10 to the 8. What it seems to indicate to me is that maybe we're looking for the wrong thing. And that's why I come down to biology. And I can't justify that in, in any sort of quantitative sort of way, because I don't understand the communications business. Um, biology, too. Um, I, get, I guess what I'm saying is that if, you, if your purpose is to seed, mm -hmm then the question is, have we been seeded? I mean, maybe that's what we are. Yeah, well, I'm just pointing out that the Grange points don't have anything in it, and that would be the obvious place to put something that we could find. Perhaps. You know, it's where you'd put your monolith. 
I'm not arguing, not arguing, arguing the, the point, but I guess I'm saying Paul? that that's one thing. And I think we're, I'm, I'm keeping you from lunch, but I'm happy to. No, no, we've still got a little, a couple of minutes. Paul? Um, a quick Maple. question. Um, I, f I find your numbers astonishingly large, but as a friend of the amendment, I think the number should be infinity. And the reason is you do yourself a disservice by wasting the energy when you launch this. If you launch it efficiently electromagnetically, and then at the other end, they recover it, you know, like a Prius when you push on the brake, there's no energy except the difference of gravitational potential or something like that. All right, so you're, that. you're channeling Ralph Landauer, who believes the communication does not cost energy. So I'd say the cost, the way I'd look at it is that the cost is to the person sending, so you'll never know what got received. So the cost is, from a technological standpoint, is to you, the sender. Right, 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 and you get it, um, you know, right. a billion years later, right. All right, I think we have one more question before lunch. So I think you're suggesting uh, biological <laughs> payloads, which means we should be spending a little time researching how to program the biological payloads in, in, uh, in the future to uh, be seeding or, and, and the implications of that to panspermia. And, and ah, you said the damn questions. word. <sighs> right, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, and I am not, that is certainly not my area at all, but, you know, that, uh, that immediately comes to mind. What does come to mind on the detection end of things is how could one detect an incursion. That's something that I'm equipped to do, you know, disciplinarity, but, you know, in terms of constructing what should be constructed, Again, I'll kind of leave that to Jill because she's kind of, you know, she does, she does radio. I know, she'd say, she's going to say, oh, I just do radio, but she does biology too. All right. Well, I've enjoyed the session this morning, and I think I'd, I'd like to ask you to thank all of our speakers.